for ProServe at, uh, at the Professional Services for Lucid Imagination. And to me, users are people who are developing solar. They're not the end users on the other side of the, you know, on the other side of the browser. So that's a little bit misleading. So who am I? Uh, if you recognize that quote up there, then, and you read the original when it came out, I know how old you are, and I know that you, I know something about your geekiness quote, uh, quotient. Been in the business a long time. Um, as I said, I'm currently employed at Lucid Imagination and ProServe. Uh, solo to scene committer. There's my email address. And I like to sail, I like to be on sailboats as a, as a hobby recreation. So if anybody has any boat deliveries to Bermuda from Boston in November, and they're going to stay in, in Bermuda, let me know. Uh, let's see. I, my remote isn't remoting, so okay. So what we'll cover, and briefly I want to go over a, a real quick highlights about what else is coming up in Solar 4.0. You saw the FST, uh, a lot of you saw the FST stuff that was, uh, you know, just before. Um, mostly, though, we're going to be talking certainly about solar cloud. That is not solar in the cloud, and we're going to be disambiguating this thing forever. Solar cloud, and we'll talk about what it is. We'll talk about the kinds of problems that it solves, the kinds of things that almost every enterprise organization that I, uh, that I work with has to tie in and struggle with <laughs> that solar cloud addresses. Um, some of those kinds of things are disaster, recover, high, disaster recovery, high availability, uh, the distributed indexing, distributed searching problems. And my last statement is I'm going to assume a basic familiarity with solar here. I'll have one brief slide about what, you know, how sharding works. But otherwise, if the word sharding is, is uh, if you don't kind of have a, a, at least a broad sense of what it does uh, and solar's replication, some of this will be a little bit opaque. I think you'll still kind of get the gist of what we're talking about, though. That said, um, I, I may commit code occasionally to Solar and Lucene, but I'm not the person who worked on this. Mark Miller is giving a talk tomorrow on a deeper technical dive on how this is implemented underneath the covers. I'm addressing the higher level concerns that like sys administrators have and your ops people are going to be dealing with. So what that means is that anything Mark says that contradicts anything I say, you believe Mark. Absolutely. And in case you have a little bit of trouble, there, that's Mark. So I showed this to Mark last night, and Mark said, I'm OK with that. But you have to add that slide. That's Yannick Seeley. So pin those two guys down for you know, deep level questions on how this stuff is actually implemented and you know, the actual code level questions. I didn't ask Yannick whether I could use that one or not, but that's OK. Um, so the cloud, what is it? Where does it come from? How do I get it? It is in trunk, and you'll, see, you'll hear us talking about solar about 4.0 and trunk, and we use them synonymously. They're essentially the next major release of solar. Should be coming out 2012. Uh, Robert Muir, who is just up here talking, is starting to circulate, agitate for releasing it. It'll, it's a little bit unusual. The way open source tends to work in, is, is somebody like Robert says, I think we should cut this release, and then there's a debate, and eventually some sort of consensus is reached, and then it's released. The plan so far is kind of unusual, and they're planning an alpha and beta. Now, there's a lot of new stuff in Solar 4.0, and you saw some of it in the last presentation. Solar Cloud is, is part of it. Um, there's some, some drastic memory improvements. So it's going to go through a little bit more of a settling process than is usual for major releases. None of this is in 3.x. Uh, 3.6 is the consensus is being reached. That's the last 3x release. There, may, there, won't be a, there probably will not be a 3.7. There may be something like a 3.6.1, but that will be minor, bu or not minor, but critical bug fixes, things like that. Um, people are often a little bit nervous about using trunk code. And you'll see in the literature, it'll say, it will, you'll see the word unstable bandied about, about trunk code. So a quick note about what that means. Um, <laughs> an example is our commercial product uses a snapshot of the trunk build and we have customers going live on it. So it's not that it's going to break every night, and it's not that it's going, to, you know, it's going to blow up every time you try and use it. What unstable really means is that some of the APIs may change, and the index format may change. So it, you, you, may, you may have situations where you're using the trunk code, if you're trying this stuff out, where you, you'll see a message come by saying, if you take a new version of trunk, you have to re-index. 
that sort of thing is not allowed after the release happens. So that's another reason why the release has to be, um, has to be pretty carefully thought out. You can pick the nightly bills up here. And I don't understand why when I made these slides, sometimes I got the nice underline and sometimes I didn't. But there are instructions for getting the source code, seeing how it all works, and building it up at that, at that site. It's a very easy process. I was, amazing. I was amazed the first time I built the uh, Solar and Lucene code how quick it was and how easy it was. You have to have Ant, you have to have Subversion, and you have to now have Ivy, and that's it. So quickly through, cool stuff in, in 4.0. Back in the mists of time when Lucene was created in the first place, the scoring algorithm was baked into lots of interesting places in the code. It just kind of lived, scattered throughout. That's all been taken out and made pluggable. There are two or three different scoring algorithms that are available out of the box, and you could create your own if you wanted to. So that's now completely open. We just went through that talk, so I'm not going to talk about that at all, except to say you really, really, really have to re read Mike McCandless' blog post about how they constructed all of that and the process they went through when they, when they were creating that. It sounds like one of, those, one of those stories you'd like to tell your grandchildren. Not only is scoring pluggable, but index formats are pluggable in 4.0. So if you want to, you can put your own, you can create your own index format, bypass all of the normal stuff that Lucene does. There, exact, there exists, as an example, a text output codec, so you can store your index in raw text form rather than all of the, all of the encoded forms. Um, okay. um, more efficient in memory structures. I ran a test at one point where I saw a 70% reduction in memory consumption by the entire solar um, you know, solar installation on um, an 11 million, 11 million document uh, corpus. And I'll, I'll repeat that one. I used one third of the memory in 4x that I was using in 3.6, 3.5 at the time. Near real time and soft commits are occurring. So that's been a long time coming. It's been a very requested feature. The spatial playground, Lucene spatial play, playground, that's what LSP stands for, is now has been moved. It's now actually part of the, re, of the release. Uh, there's something called pivot faceting. I think of it as a multidimensional faceting process. Uh, pseudo join queries. You saw that in uh, in Martin's comment earlier. Uh, there's a new there's a new admin UI. It looks like it's built sometime post 1995. It's actually it's, it's pretty sweet. The guy who did that work, um, you know, I, I can't I can't say enough about how much effort he put into it. It's just one of those things that was that never got updated. You find all of this stuff in the changes.txt file. And be aware that there are at least two of them, one in the solar tree and one in the, in the, in the Lucene tree. The, if I remember correctly, the Lucene one has over 700 lines of things that have changed between the, the 3x and 4x lines. Um, so it's, it's, there's quite a bit of information in there. I can't, I, I can't overemphasize the need to look through those as you upgrade. OK, um, that's the quick. The quick overview of what's coming up in 4.0. Let's talk a little bit about solar cloud. Would you, would you, would you look the other way when I re read these so I don't get nervous that I'm misrepresenting something? This is Mark Miller is right down here on the floor, by the way. <laughs> I have to point you out. Um, basically, solar cloud is a, is a set of distributed capabilities in solar. So it will do automatic distributing of updates, which are the indexing process. It'll do automatic to, you know, to whatever shards you, you put in place. It uses transaction logs to, re to record the deltas so that you're, it's a much more robust indexing process. You're not nearly so likely to lose documents in the case of any sort of interruptions of your indexing process. It will automatically distribute searches in your sharded environment. You don't have to really manage that anymore. Um, supports near real-time searching. That's just what it does out of the box. It will use, and it uses Zookeeper as a repository for the state information. Zookeeper is another <laughs> Apache project that is, um, that's, being, that's incorporated into uh, Solar Cloud, or that, that's how Solar Cloud manages to coordinate all of the machines in the cluster. So I promised to talk a little bit about why you should care about this. Um, I work at, as I said, I work with ProServe Professional Services. Our job is to go out and talk to customers and help them implement a solar solution. 
as I, and when I do that, I, I've been amazed by a couple of things. Number one is the number of different problems that search is used to, that is used to try and solve, the number of different domains and, and uh, specialty areas. But the second thing that I find kind of interesting is there's a, there's a common theory, series of things that all of our enterprise customers have to solve at some point. Solar Cloud will address a series of those things and make that a lot easier on people. Number one, sharding. Currently, if you have enough, enough data that it's not going to fit on one machine, you have to shard it across multiple machines. You have to understand sharding. You have to put the right documents on the right shard. You have to, un you, and you have to um, pay very close attention to how, that, to how you operate or how you index data. That's mandatory. If you put the same document on two, on two different shards, it's now, it now will show up twice in your results list. People spend a lot of time trying, tracking down that kind of error. Capacity expansion. Um, capacity expansion is actually pretty straightforward in solar, but it's a common thing. Everybody has to do it at some point. They decide they want to have more, the uh, query rate that they're getting is not fast enough, or they can't handle the query rate that they want to, the traffic grows, they have to add some sort of capacity. System status. Uh, one, of the, one of the very common questions I have is, okay, I've got these 30 machines out there running solar, how do I know that they're healthy? How do I know that they're all running? I'll say right now that Solar Cloud does not directly, it, it makes some things, especially with Zookeeper, easier to monitor. It doesn't provide that kind of monitoring out of the box, but this is a common problem. Uh, replication configuration. All of you who've configured replication, master slave replication in Solar, know that it's just a couple lines in the config file, right? That's all it is. But you, in a sharded environment, each of those slaves have to has to point to the right master or the right core on the master. There are places to mess it up. It's, it's just another, it's, it's, and when you do do it incorrectly, it can, be, it can be really difficult and kind of subtle to track down. Um, near real time, recently indexed data, that seems, to be a, that seems to be something everybody wants, everybody says we need it. I often challenge our clients saying, uh, okay, is 10, minutes, is 10 minutes close enough to near real time? And in a lot of situations it is, in some situations it isn't, and in some situations 30 seconds is too long. Inappropriate configuration. We have clients who, uh, as a, who are trying to get things to be close enough to real time. They'll do things like commit after every document. They'll try and replicate every five seconds, and they'll wonder why their system is slow, why their slaves consume an enormous amount of memory, why their indexing time varies because it bounces up and down, because the background uh, segments are being merged, et cetera, et cetera. You mismatch. Uh, the schema of the config file and the master of the slave. All of a sudden, you have situations where you're not finding documents. Uh, uh, let's say you have four shards. Set the system up. It's fine. It's running. Your boss comes to you and says, I'm not seeing all the documents I should see. Um, in fact, I'm missing about a quarter of my documents, and you discover you misconfigured something, and your slaves aren't searching on the, on the shard that contains a quarter of your data, a quarter of your data. None of that is technically difficult to fix. None of it is technically difficult to understand. It's just, it's a, it's just an administration problem. And that's where the operations people um, get called at 3.30 in the morning and they're not very happy. So maintaining that set of configurations and coordinating them is, is the difficulty. Solar Cloud will address a lot of these. I need to emphasize that, that um, the committers or the coders, people who have been coding up Solar Cloud have been doing an enormous amount of work it's looking pretty good right now. It's usable right now. Be aware that it's actually it's being improved continually. Um, I've seen one one of the uh, people on the users list has been has pulled out Solar Cloud. He's starting to work with it. He's he's you know essentially is, he and Mark talk a lot when he's and he, when he's put something up on the users list saying you know I'm using Solar Cloud. This isn't quite working the way I expect. Mark will usually reply or somebody will usually reply very quickly because this is a very hot area of development right now. And I encourage anybody who wants to play with Solar Cloud to do the same thing. The more eyes we get on it, the more situations we see in it, the faster we see that, the more solid 4.0 will be when it gets released. This is my one slide for replication and sharding in solar. Everybody who's tried to configure an enterprise system knows this slide pretty well. Uh, you've got your master machines up here. Okay, your indexing, machine, indexing process is smart enough to put the right documents on the right masters. Your slaves are down here. 
Each one of these is configured to point to the right master to, to pull the correct data down. Somewhere out there, you've got a load balancer that distributes uh, incoming searches across your search machines. And the configuration on each of these search machines knows about the other shards. If you get all that right, all that working, then you're good to go. So to set all that up, um, figure out how many shards you need, uh, configure all the masters, and then make sure your external indexing process or processes, which could be a very long and complex pipeline, depending on my, my friend Greg can vouch for a long, complex pipeline. Um, when that all happens, and when you have figured all of that out, then your external process or processes has to be able to put the documents on the correct uh, master and keep putting additional copies of that document on the same master. Because what, one of the things that goes on is that um, if you put the same document ID on two different, uh, two different uh, shards, they're two different documents as far as, as Solar and Lucene are concerned. So then I got that configured. My index is being built. I go ahead and I configure the slays. Uh, I configure for distributed searching. I make sure the slays point to the right place, the master for their index. Um, I, I think I left something out here. Make sure the slaves know where the other shards are. And then find out where you misconfigured something. You're getting dupli duplicate documents. Documents are being missed. Heaven only knows what. But there's something not right about that. And you, then you go through the long process of tracking it all down. Um, spend perhaps a fair amount of time figuring out what the misconfiguration was, because the symptom is not always ob the cause of something is not always obvious. And then as soon as you start changing the configuration, you do it all over again. None of this, again, is conceptually horribly difficult, but there are a series of moving parts, and they all have to be coordinated and have to agree with each other. So, fill the cloud. The first step is the same. Decide how many shards you need. Go over to your operations people and ask them how many spare machines they have laying around. Pick one. Start it with this wonderful set of commands. Bootstrap, comforter, don't worry about it a lot. I'm just... I will say that you have to do this once, and the bootstrap beast is the thing that informs the zookeeper, the zookeeper machine uh, ensemble. Uh, it, it essentially uploads the configuration files from this master to the, to the uh, zookeeper machine, but just start it up this way. All the other machines, you just start them up and just point them at the zookeeper machine. machine. That's it. Indexing, I remember all that stuff I, I said a couple, three times, how you have, to, you have to try and make sure your indexing process and your pipeline know what shard to send to. Don't bother. Pick a machine. We don't care what machine. Send your index, send your updates to that machine, and you're done. Same with searches. The, the typical kind of configuration for a, a sharded master-slave setup would be not only do you have one slave, you have multiple slaves. There's a load balancer fronting each set of shard of slaves on for each shard, each slave has to point to the load balancer for that fronts the other shards. Just ignore all of that, just send the search out and you're done. So your load balancer now can sit in front, can distribute your queries across all the machines in your cluster without paying any attention and there's no configuration on those machines you have to worry about. A uh, quick note on Zookeeper. I am, uh, you know, I was, I was one of the principles, one of the things that's been very pleasant in my working with solar is how easy it is to get a quick demo up, to actually get the, to get, get the code down and start using it. So that tradition's been carried through with solar cloud and in the, uh, the instructions, and I have a bunch of URLs at the end of the, of the presentation. Um, it uses an embedded zookeeper that, that runs in the same, the same server, this runs in the solar instance. Most production Organizations, most production environments won't do that. And there's, there's no, so you'll have an external zookeeper, it's called an ensemble, that will actually be how you, you would configure a zookeeper in production. But the, the embedded zookeeper will get you up and running in just a few minutes. You'll spend most of the time copying, <laughs> copying directories around. And again, the, uh, the, boot, the bootstrap, be, uh, bootstrap, Flag only has to only has to be run the first time. Oh, it's not working. I'll just put that in my pocket. So 
So now I'm, I'm going to go into the indexing process. Um, it's, not really the, it's not really the indexing process, but I want to show you how data moves around a solar cloud group of servers. This is going to be the longest section, uh, the longest individual section, and you'll notice you may get a little worried when you start getting nearer the end before I'm done with this. But once you're kind of through this process, understanding the kinds of things that go on with um, searching and the other kinds of things that you do are pretty are actually pretty straightforward once that's once you get your mind around wrapped around what, how, what works here. So I said that you start things up. Um, you just start this machine. You tell a Zookeeper to you bootstrap to Zookeeper and tell it the number of shards you need, and you're done. So how are they assigned? Well, for all of those complicated questions about exactly how things are configured, it's magic, ask Mark or ask Yannick. It's really kind of a round robin basis. Um, I have a little, a little slide in here later that'll put that up graphically. But, but essentially, as each machine is started, it's assigned to the next shard until you have at least one shard up for each, for each or one machine up for each shard. Uh, and there's the information about not only the configuration, how many shards you want, et cetera, is kept in Zookeeper, but the current status of all of the, the machines in your cluster are, is, is also available from Zookeeper. Um, at the, the master-slave distinction that you used to in solar replication, solar and solar scaling, really doesn't exist anymore. There are now replicas, there are now only replicas, and one of those replicas is going to be a leader. And the leader has some additional responsibilities, but it is basically just a normal machine. You, you, you index to it, you search from it. It's not any different from the other replicas in terms of its functionality, except it has some coordination responsibilities. So there's only going to be one leader per shard. And initially, it's just a first come, first serve basis on a round robin, <laughs> on a round robin uh, basis, and until you have one for each. You start bringing up more machines for solar cloud and more machines. And these are, these are another replica is going to be assigned. And that's just assigned on a round robin basis once you have at least one, one replica for each shard. So as you bring up more and more machines, they just start being added. So all of your shards will have the same number within one machines. So if you have three shards, six machines, each one will have two. If you have three shards and seven machines, well, you can't, you can't subdivide a machine into threes. So the, your first shard will have three machines instead of two. So graphically, it looks like this. So I've got a, I've got a machine out there. I've uh, installed solar on it. I provide a couple, of, a couple of parameters for it. This is the bootstrap one. And I, give it, I tell it where the, where the Zookeeper hosts are. I can have as many Zookeeper hosts as I want to. Generally, you, you will almost certainly want to have at least three. And I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So now I run over, whoops, got two of them at once. Start my second machine. Now note the only thing I'm telling this machine is where my host is, host or hosts are. It queries Zookeeper, finds configuration information, essentially negotiates with Zookeeper to, to um, or, or uses that information to understand what its role should be and becomes the leader of shard two. Start up the third machine. Notice. My command is the same. I haven't done anything new between, for the, between the second and the third. And indeed, when I restart all this stuff, I'll restart shard one with the same parameters because I bootstrapped it already. So at this point, you can start indexing. One of the current, um, I don't know if I want to call it a limitation, but one of the current characteristics is that you have to have at least one machine up per shard before you start indexing, searching, that sort of thing. Bring up the next machine, it does the same thing, negotiates with, understands what its role should be, and, become, and becomes the replica for shard one. The same command is used, has been used on all of these three now, and so on. As the machines come up, they, they keep getting assigned and assigned and assigned. So I want to, I've alluded to some of this, I want to go over it a little more explicitly. Um, there aren't any masters and slaves anymore. That distinction's gone, which also means the configuration that, that you used to have to do, so you'd have a slightly different configuration for master and slave that you had to keep straight. You'd adjust your caches at some point on the slaves. You'd disable, disable them on the slaves. You would talk about RAM buffer size and megabytes on the masters, all that sort of thing. Um, I really, that, that distinction is lost in Solar Cloud. They're all just replicas. 
Some of them are leaders. So, and the leaders have a little bit of coordination responsibility. Um, if a leader goes down, what happens? Well, that gets detected. And one of the other replicas of that leader is now elected the leader, and you carry on just without having to do any intervention whatsoever. Um, so that all of that organization, all of that uh, structuring of what all of the your uh, cluster looks like is pretty is done through coordination via Zookeeper. Send the document to a machine uh, to be indexed. What happens? Well, if I'm a if I'm a replica, we've just passed it up to the leader. That's it. Nothing that nothing happens. If I'm a leader. I go through that doc, I determine whether that document belongs on my shard or not. If it is, I index it myself to my own repository so I can handle searches, and I forward the request to all of, my, all of the uh, replicas in my shard. If the document does not belong to my shard, I package it up and I send it to the leader of the right shard, and it's, and it's distributed. So it doesn't matter where in the cluster the, in, the incoming request the, comes in, the documents get to the right place. That's the distributed indexing portion of it. Um, it is not on a single document basis. In other words, if you're batching documents in, if I pass 100 documents in a single batch, some of them belong to my, this shard, some of them belong to the other shards, then the leader is responsible for parsing that out, figuring out the correct destination for all of the documents in that packet and getting them to the right place. It batches those up currently in groups of 10, I believe. Um, I don't know, I don't think there's any, any uh, magic about that number, it's just where we, we're or it's just kind of a, a batch size to start with, sir. Okay. Uh, this, your question is, if a leader goes down, what happens? Well, number one, what happens is a new leader is elected, but an indexing request doesn't really come back if I have, I hope I have this one right, Mark. An indexing request doesn't come back until the distribution has happened and the, and the transaction logs have been written. To the, to the other nodes in the cluster. And we'll, I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few seconds. Um, now imagine you have a, you have a situ, uh, situation where your system's been running for a while, and it's coming up on Christmas season, it's, it's you know, mid-November, and you're an e-commerce site, and what you really want to do is you know you're going to have a lot, more, a lot more requests coming through your system for the next six weeks. Bringing up a new machine, you saw how I said you could add, you could start it up with a ZK host parameter and it would assign itself to the right shard. Well, another couple things happen under the covers at that point. Number one is it figures out what shard it belongs to and it gets assigned to the right shard. It'll probably pull an old style replication to begin with. So old style replication is still used, you just don't have to configure it. That's the most efficient way to bring a bulk, the bulk of the index <coughs> down. So that's what that was happening there. No user intervention required. That's going to be a snapshot. There, perhaps, potentially, there have been updates since there are, there's an open segment. Uh, somebody, you, you haven't done a commit on the master at that point, which you don't have to do, but it hasn't been done at that point. And at that point, the transaction log gets replayed to bring the two in synchronous, to get them, you know, to get the new replica synchronized with the slave. And at that point, searches are forwarded to the new slave. So. Bringing up new capacity in terms of adding new machines is simply just starting a bunch of new servers and sitting back and watching things go. So I mentioned the transaction log. What's that? Well, as, as documents come in, con conceptually for me, they're just you know, written out to disk in this, this thing that we can traverse and replay. So what that allows is that is anytime your indexing process is interrupted for any reason, you can go ahead and replay parts of that log to catch up the things that weren't committed and, and written in, uh, written to disk in your index itself. <coughs> At this point, there's there's some heuristics applied. Uh, if, as the machine comes up, say it's been interrupted for some reason, and as it comes up, it, it investig the negotiation is carried out to say how many how many doc documents am I behind at this juncture, and it chooses the the essentially a decision is made about what the best way to bring it up into synchronization is. And that could be replication, it could be just replaying the transaction log. I mentioned soft commits. Um, <coughs> I should make sure and emphasize that this is, you know, this is part of NRT, 
It's used by Solar Cloud. It is not, is not part of Solar Cloud. In other words, you can use new, near real time searching and not be running Solar Cloud at all. It's just a new feature in, in Core Solar. The answer to near real time searching, I think of it as almost an in memory open writable segment, something like that. Just a set of in memory structures that take documents that have not yet been committed to disk or <laughs> committed to a segment and allow them to be searchable as soon as, as soon as that operation happens before you commit. Um, on a hard commit, the normal commits that we're, that we're accustomed to, the same thing happens as, always, as, as has always happened. The segment's closed, it's finalized, any um, uh, searches are reopened, searches are warmed, all that sort of thing goes on. Soft commits can happen really quickly. They're set for, they're set for a second at this point in the, in the default solar configuration file. So that's now the, de the delay between the time something gets indexed and, some, and it's searchable. Plus a little bit, but I'll, I'll wave my hands because there's, it's, realistically it's going to be a bit longer. Um, and that's my comment about solar cloud. <coughs> so once, you, once you're through that part, the rest is easy. Um, well, it's actually very hard, but somebody else did the work, so it's really easy. So searching at this point just happens. Since there's no distinction between masters and slaves, a, a re search request can be sent to any, any machine in the cluster. Same as indexing. You don't, have to, you don't have to worry about what's where anymore. Searching is, is near real time. Uh, replication is not, isn't a factor in how long it takes to, to search a document that you've indexed. There will be a couple of small delays in here. Uh, number one, you remember I, I kind of waved my hands and said the, the, the request comes in to us to a machine, it gets forwarded to the leader and forwarded to the other leaders. So there's going to be some processing delay while that happens. Uh, there's going to be then your, auto, your soft commit interval, which you can configure in solar config XML just like you could uh, configure auto commit. And then that's set to a second. And then there's going to be the warm up time, or not warm up time, I'm sorry. That's, that's it. So you'll have some, you'll have some you know, network transportation and analysis uh, delays. They'll be very small. I, I personally don't think they're going to be actually noticeable, particularly noticeable for people. And we'll go over the rest of these things fairly quickly. Uh, capacity expansion I've mentioned. I, we'll talk a little bit more about it. System status, replication entity, and Zookeeper. Typical problem we see clients all the time who put together a, situ uh, a situation where they can monitor their, their throughput rate and figure out that they need to um, they're coming up on some of their limits. They don't want they want their, their users to still have a good search experience, so they need to add some capacity. This is not adding new shards in for this slide. This is just adding being able to increase your query per second rate and let's claim your index is constant size. <coughs> so all you do at that point is you install solar on, on on however many more machines you have available. You start them up with a ZK host guy. You might want to register them with your front end load balancer but it's just a single load balancer, so you don't really worry about it. And if you don't, internal to Solar Cloud are distributed, um, some distributed processing components that will go ahead and fire off the sub-shard requests to all the available shards on a round-robin basis. So you, get some, so you get some load balancing built in underneath the covers with Solar Cloud itself. So you bring it up, probably want to register it with your load balancer, but even if you don't, it'll still be used, which is another place you could, you could mess up the, uh, the current um, sharded search solution. And then you just sit back and watch. I mean, I'd probably do it at night because you're going to replicate a lot of indexes, but you know, just, just sit back and watch. So in reducing capacity, you just shut down the machine. At that point, Solar Cloud will detect that information and will just kind of take that particular machine out of the, uh, out of the uh, request chain. System status, uh, if you look at the new admin UI and you, and you have a cloud system up, it, you have to have a cloud situation running before you see the links in the new UI to, to see your cloud state. It will show you the cloud state. I'm, I haven't yet run this, this, this uh, solar cloud on, a, on a, some, something with 500 machines, so I'm not sure there's enough real estate in the admin UI to actually do that for you, to actually show that reasonably. But for your experimentation, it's a neat little, neat little tool. Visual state, graphs, trees, that sort of thing. Up, state of machines, up, down. Um, 
Sending alerts, that's, it was, was under discussion. It's not there today. That's one of the other things that sysadmins really, really, really want out of a, out of a large cluster. They want to know when something, when something goes wrong. I will say that the fact that Zookeeper is out there gives you another avenue for determining that information and incorporating it into whatever uh, monitoring so software you already have. One of my, I like to think one of my marks of, of growing up as a programmer when I did a lot more of that was when I, I got less, uh, I felt less bad, or I started actually to feel good, if you want the truth, when I could take code that I'd written and taken a long time understanding and caused me great grief and I could rip it out and throw it away. So most of what you understand and, have to, and think you have to do for replication and for sharding is just not relevant with Solar Cloud. You can just, you can make way in your, make some room in your head for new, for new concepts. Um, and as I said, this, this, when machines go up and down, the network burps, recovery is automatic at this point. Near real time, um, it's been a long time coming. It's been something people have wanted for a long, long time. We've seen situations where, yeah, never mind. Uh, it's near real time because, it, as I mentioned before, there are still some propagation delays, and I don't know if there's going to be any way around that. But, I, but in general, I think they'll be so short as to be unnoticeable. Um, double loop. Zookeeper is, uh, as I said, this is, this is the quote from the, zoo, the Zookeeper page. That's the URL. It's simply a centralized service for maintaining things, uh, maintaining state information. So a lot of the complexity is actually kind of solved with Zookeeper at this juncture. A little bit more about Zookeeper and with cloud. As I said, ZK Run uh, actually starts at the embedded Zookeeper guy, makes the tutorials very simple to use. You'll probably want to run an ensemble. An ensemble is more than one machine. The point of an ensemble is that if you just had one Zookeeper machine out there, your Zookeeper machine now becomes your single point of failure. So if you fire up, say, three of them, it works on a quorum system, and they, they tend to communicate with each other, vote, keep themselves in sync, that sort of thing. It's much more robust than just having one, one server out there. And yes, you'll have to get, put some effort that, in the room in your head that you made for the replication. By taking the replication stuff out, you have to be able to, use, to deal with Zookeeper at, that po at this point. But um, your, your, your age and geekiness complex is, uh, score is also increased if you know where that came from and read the original. Stands, it's a Robert Heinlein book, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, and the motto of the, moon, the Lunar Republic was, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Couple quick gotchas. Um, it's new and changing. Not everything is there yet. Optimistic locking is being worked on. You'll see some JIRAs going on for that. At least one machine has to be running for shard or else uh, really unpleasant errors get reported. People are working on this, but you know, on, the, on, the, on the notion that you really want to get the, to get the code out there being used before it's completely perfect, you'll, you know, be aware that these things will happen in the, in the state currently. There's a new field in your schema.xml that comes out, underbar version underbar, do not remove it, or your solar cloud will have real, will, will be um, unhappy. The version is used to deal with um, the fact that you may send the same document simultaneously to two separate machines to be indexed. Somehow you've got to figure out which one, which one is the one that should be used. Some of your infrastructure is obsolete. You can start tearing it down. Um, the whole notion of solar cloud is on the front end of the learning curve. <coughs> and when we start putting this into massive installations, it's going to be, we'll, we'll see what shakes out. I suspect there'll be some bumps in the road. I, I've seen them already. I've also seen the, the people who are actually coding this, the, the code, see something reported and fix it within two hours. So be aware that, the, that, that things, will be, things will be changing. We'll be learning a lot. We'll be learning a lot about capacity. If you're, if you're hosing 10,000 documents a second at a solar cloud structure, I'm not quite sure how, I don't know how well it'll work. We'll find out soon. You get some indexing throughput penalty. And this is trunk. So you may see notifications coming through saying things like index format has changed. If you take a new trunk version, you have to re-index. Um, there's a whole list of URLs, and this will be available online after sometime after the conference. So. This is, Mike McCandless's blog is very good. Simon Wilnar's is very good. 
Lucid Imagination, of course, is the best there. Um, places to get the source code, SolarWiki. I'm going to over, go, overshoot by a minute, but I'm the last session, so people are asleep. Document writer per thread is a very interesting, <laughs> interesting beast. There's, it's taking care of the, of the spike problem that used to happen with, index, with indexing as uh, massive merge happens. We had the FST talk earlier. There's the base uh, URL for, out for playing with Solar Cloud. Jira addresses. Oh, I've got a lot of them. Some of Yannick Seeley's pre uh, presentations uh, for things like pivot faceting and Solar 4.0. Granting, yeah, you'll like this one. And finally, that this is, this is uh, something we wrote up at one point, uh, outlining some of the tests we did for memory reduction for, between uh, Solar 4 and Solar 3X versions. One minute and eight seconds extra. <laughs> Yes, the other thing that's not here yet, it's, it's certainly on the drawing board, and I rather expect it for 4.0, is the ability to say, three shards is not enough. I need four. Go do your magic and make it distributed. That's not there yet. Um, there, are Jira's, there are Jira's talking about that. It's expected to be there. If not, for the first 4.0 release, it'll be, it's high on the list, I'll put it that way. Absolutely is something we need to do. Question is that since, since we're despecializing machines, each machine is both capable of indexing and searching, is there a penalty for people to be paid for, uh, you know, for throughput. I expect a small one, but remember that, that I also saw a two-thirds memory reduction, so I, you may effectively be, wind up with more capacity even though, and you know, if everything were equal, it probably is, it would be reduced a bit. Does it uh, still apply, uh, is it the same uh, behavior? Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Cache warming. Mm -hmm. Oh, search your warming. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the, cam the guy with the camera fits by walking around like this. Yeah, it will still it will effectively be the same. There are, there are mechanisms built in whereby the near real time doesn't really affect warming. But a hard commit is still going to close your searchers, it's still going to open new ones, it's still going to do the warming, auto warming, that sort of thing. There, there, let me see if I got the question right. If you lose the last shard of your replica, uh, last replica of your shard, pardon me, what happens? Uh, you start getting errors all over the place from all of your searchers. That's a place that's not robust at this juncture. Well, there isn't an indexing machine. When, you, when, I, when I say you lose the last replica of your shard, that means that every machine associated with this shard is down. If you lose a, a leader, one of the other, any other replica will be elected the leader. Things will, you'll keep driving on. If you lose a replica but still have one of the other ones, you'll still be fine. No, uh, the question, let me see if I got the question correct. So say all of the, all of the replicas for a shard go down. You're asking, will, it, will we still be able to get partial results back? Right. Currently, no. I know, it's, I know Mark, is, Mark wants, to do, wants to work on that. Currently, if all of the machines for a shard go, for a, all of the replicas for a shard go down, then uh, the system grinds to a halt. That's, you know, I, I, that, I, I really hasten to point out that this is, that's kind of why I was trying to emphasize that it's a work in progress. We know there are some rough edges. That's one of them, and that's high on the list. We, we actually, we're not quite sure what the right answer is there, because now you start having transaction logs that are having to store data. To, I mean, you, you've, you've potentially lost all of your indexes, so how do you resynchronize? It's, it's really a sticky wicket. So I don't know how they're going to answer that. Oh, so we're searching. I'm sorry. And I, I miss, misheard part of the question. Uh, that's the same answer. Currently, for searching, it still go, it still drops down. I know that that being it's being thought about that you should be you should return partial results and some indication that you didn't get them all. Yeah, the the comment was you need to have a lot of hardware. You need to have enough hardware so you're not going to get that many failures that <laughs> fast and cause you to, to cause all the shards to, to the shard to go down. And that and that that's pretty much true. One of the things I want to emphasize, if you're playing around with this is that kind of the underlying model is that machines aren't failing every two seconds. So if you bring up solar cloud and you start saying, kill this machine, start this machine, kill this machine, start this machine, then things kind of will, it won't look as robust as they are. Uh, it takes a while to do the recovery and the synchronization. But if you're having, as, as the gentleman says, if you're, having, if you're having a failure rate of a machine every two seconds and they're coming down and back up at that rate, there's some other problems in your system. I release you. <laughs> um,